I'm excited about today because we are in our series, Killing Hostility, and we are in Ephesians chapter four, and it is going to be awesome. If you have not been around for this series, I'm loving it. Anyone enjoying just the whole study on Ephesians and reading through it with your life groups, it's, it's been a ton of fun. So there's a few things that we need to establish. One is some things about the Trinity, which is a massive doctrine of ours that if you don't have that one locked in, it's gonna create some complications for you and your faith. There's also this tripod that I wanna keep in front of us as uh, something that we understand, maybe a framework as to how do we live out this life with Christ. And as we've noticed in this series, Paul's favorite statement in all of his writings is this idea of being in Christ. And much of what we'll discuss today um, has to, uh, well, is facilitated by this idea that you and I, who are believers, we are in Christ. And so let's go ahead and pray, and then we will jump into Ephesians chapter four. God, so thankful for your goodness, and God, we are thankful for all that you seek to do in and through our lives. And Lord, we ask that in this moment, you would ready our hearts and minds to receive your word. And God, whatever you have in store for us, may we just uh, humbly receive it, and God, continue to trust you and to lean upon you uh, for guidance and instruction, as well as strength, peace, and clarity within our life. And God, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Recently, I was on a, a flight, and I like it when the flight doesn't have an automated system doing the stuff that stewardess used to do. For example, now on most planes, they have a TV in the headrest, and so the safety protocol and all the instructions about your seat belt and your mask, well, that's all done on a TV. It's illustrated. But I like it when you get on a plane that doesn't have that technology and they have to do it the old school way where the stewardess have to get in the aisle and they have to show you how to put on the seatbelt and they have to show you how to use your mask and they always wanna really drive home the point, hey, let your mother-in-law and let your kids suffocate first. You get your mask on first and then you deal with them, which we're all thinking to ourselves, okay, I get it and I'm sure there's science behind it. I'm gonna help them first. I don't know, it's something in my nature. Uh, but my favorite thing about it is when the stewardess goes off script on the walkie-talkie and they kind of just make the script their own. You ever been on a flight where it's like, okay, I don't know if they're gonna get fired for this, but this is fantastic. They're kind of making it their own. There was this lady on this flight I was recently on and she was owning it. This was probably the funniest uh, just instruction safety protocol that I had heard. She gets to the end and she says, now for all of you who were listening, enjoy your flight. And for those of you who didn't listen, good luck. And uh, <laughs> I love that. And I, I kind of feel that way in some sense when it comes to the book of Ephesians and where we're at in our study as a church. We have gone through Ephesians chapter three. We're launching into Ephesians chapter four where Paul is going to shift. And what we've established is Paul has this a uh, pretty consistent approach to his writing. He starts out high on theology and then he shifts towards practical matters and how does this look and play out in and through our lives. And so we are now making that, that transition. Paul has been doing a deep dive with some very loaded theological constructs. And I think it's really important for us to have those things intact when it comes to our relationship with God. And I would just encourage you, if you missed the first three weeks, uh, go back and listen to those messages uh, because it is critical to your spiritual formation. I have a, a buddy who pastors a wonderful church out in California, and we were recently talking about spiritual formation, which is the goal behind all of this, what we're doing right now. Every single one of us are leaning in. Most of us are Christians, and we understand that that means we're followers of Christ, we're disciples, we're learners, we're students, and we are in this journey learning and growing and becoming more and more like Christ. And that is a part of the, the process that we are in. And when it comes to spiritual formation, my buddy says this. He says, spiritual formation without a spiritual foundation leads to spiritual manipulation. Think about it. Spiritual formation, your discipleship, your shaping in a sense, 
without, spiritual, without a spiritual foundation, it leads to spiritual manipulation. And, and I think that's critical. I think it's something that we have to keep in mind and it's really important for us as a church to always understand this because it is really easy and very detrimental to churches to set God's word aside and then to begin developing our entire camp and community around man's preferences, opinions, and ideas, which is uh, really troubling. That without a rooted foundation in God's word, uh, there is going to be a sure tendency uh, to drift into unproductive matters when it comes to our relationship with God. And so it is having some of those things intact. And Paul, when he starts out, he really lands three ideas when it comes to the Trinity. So if you're new to the faith, we believe in one God who exists in three persons. This is the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. This is, without a doubt, one of the most, if not the most, mysterious doctrines in our faith. How does this God exist in three persons? This is a wild mystery. That said, uh, without the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, Christianity begins to unravel. You are going to find it incredibly difficult to understand, embrace, as well as apply uh, God's word to your life and to live out this faith without a clear understanding of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Sorry, the Holy Trinity. So in this, Ephesians chapter one, two, Paul even then references it again in Ephesians chapter four. What he wants us to understand is one, God the Father chose us. Two, God the Son redeemed us. And three, God the Holy Spirit sealed us. And when you understand this, this framework and how this works, you know, Paul starts out and he says, uh, that God chose, God predestined before the foundations of the earth uh, that you would be, arrive at this point in history and that you would accomplish good works that he has set before you and I. That God chose you in his foreknowledge, God acted on your behalf. This is an amazing thing. And God chose you and beyond that, God redeemed you, which is pretty obvious when you look at Christ on the cross. You see what God is trying to do. God the Father sent God the Son, and there he hangs on a cross paying ransom for the sins of the world. We understand God choosing us. We understand God redeeming us. Where most people get tripped up is when it comes to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit sealing us. In ancient times, when a letter would be sent, they would seal the letter with a stamp. And that letter was kind of their signature. It let them know that you can entrust the message that you now hold on to knowing where it's from. And it was a seal of approval and it was a seal of ownership. And so now that you and I are in Christ, we've been redeemed in Christ. Christ steps to the cross, pays ransom. There is this great reversal, this remarkable exchange that he takes on our death so we can take on his life. He takes earth so we get heaven, right? He makes this great reversal. He, he becomes, a, a, you know, a, a child of a, you know, broken family also that we could become a child of a perfect family. Does that make sense? There's all this great reversal stuff happening. And because of what Christ do, does on the cross, you and I are what would be called justified. We've been justified in Christ that now when Christ or when God looks at you, God the Father sees God the Son, that you are in Christ. He sees Jesus. Is, is that making sense? I know it's a lot like, boom, here it comes. Um, and so now you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, that now there is this stamp of approval upon your life. Now there is this seal that indicates you have been sent by God and you belong to God. And that's the Holy Spirit's work in your life. You have been sent by God and you belong to God. And so the idea then becomes, okay, what does God seek to do in and through our lives? And if we are sent by God, representing God with his stamp of approval upon our lives, well then how should we live? 
And that really is where Paul begins to shift the focus. And much of what you're gonna find in scripture when you begin to engage in your faith is there is a pretty heavy emphasis on character development. Now understand this, this is not saying that you have to behave or perform in a certain way also that God will love you or that you can earn your salvation. No, that's bad theology and that's actually not what we're saying. God loves you not because of who you are but because of who he is. Nothing you could ever do could earn any of his love and nothing you could ever do could lose any of his love. God is love fully and completely perfect love and he loves you at all times unconditionally, right? And so you don't have to earn, you don't have to perform, you don't have to do all this stuff to manipulate the heartstrings of his heart. No, God, God loves you. That's an amazing thing to think about. So we're not earning. Well, what is the, the point then? Well, the point is Christ comes and he redefined what it meant to be human. And he established a new reality that folks, there's life beyond the grave. And so now you and I live with this awareness that what we've experienced and what we've seen cannot be unseen. And now that we know that there's a, a new way of life and that there is an eternal hope, we now wanna live anchored and oriented to those things. Okay, how should this change my life? And you know, God's word instructs us in so many different ways. Well, over time, you will start to look and act more and more like Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I look at the world, I think to myself, oh my goodness, it would be a better place if more people looked and acted like Jesus. Now, when it comes to character development, there's a lot to be said in scripture, but I do think there are three virtues, attributes, that as you go throughout God's word, they are elevated to the top of all the spiritual attributes and character uh, matters. And that would be humility, integrity, can't spell, and generosity. A lot to be said in... a. Uh, scripture about your character, but know that much of it flows from these three things, humility, integrity, and generosity. And we've all sat at tables, and I've used this illustration before, that if you've ever sat at a table where one, short is, uh, one leg is shorter than the other, what happens? The, the table wobbles. And, and I would just say, uh, if you feel wobbly in your faith, there is a good chance that you're maybe coming up short in one of these three areas. That's just something to consider. Hey, is there any way that I feel a little wobbly or shaky in this pursuit of Christ and living out my faith? You might wanna look at those three things. And Paul is, he's shifting us towards this idea that now that you are in Christ, now that you understand your spiritual foundation, now that we have these theological truths in place, okay, well, now your beliefs should shape your behaviors. Now, this is really important for us to understand because we see that this is backwards in a lot of churches. In fact, sometimes we get this wrong ourselves where we don't understand the natural progression of beliefs preceding behaviors. And so what we will at times fall into is expecting people who show up to our church who have no frame of reference for God, they have no experience within the church, they've never read God's word, they've never been in a space like this, they don't believe what we believe, yet we expect them to show up and behave the way we behave. And that's well, that's a faulty way of thinking. In fact, it's gonna be exhausting and very discouraging because if people don't believe what we believe, folks, they're not gonna behave the way we behave. And a lot of Christians are going throughout life frustrated with the world for not behaving like Christians. I think it is poor stewardship of our energy and our efforts to try to get non-Christians to act like Christians. If anything, I think we should just be focused on getting Christians to act like Christians. Just act like a Christian. You know, one of the great 10 commandments, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. I don't think it's so much by our words, but it's our lifestyle that we take it in vain. 
Hey, I'm a Christian, I just don't live like it. Hey, I'm all for Jesus, I just don't resemble him. And Paul says, yeah, but if you understand that your beliefs will shape your behavior, and over time, the natural consequence of a life in Christ is the fruit of the Spirit. It's a beautiful idea. The natural consequence to following Christ is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Those are gonna be the natural consequences as you walk this thing out. And Paul comes to us in Ephesians chapter four. And uh, I gotta tell you, this, he says too much in this chapter. I could probably do a whole year on Ephesians chapter four. But he starts out and he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Through the bond of peace, there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. So Paul says a lot here. You know, we won't address the fact that he refers to himself as a prisoner. We we talked about that last week. But he does say some things that you have to take into consideration. And the first thing he says is walk worthy of the calling. Can you walk this thing out? And it reminds me of all like the 90s trash talk we would say on the playground. Remember, we would say things like, I know you are, but what am I, right? I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. But what was the go-to? You'd pump up your chest and you'd say, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk, right? That was like our go-to. And in some ways that's kind of starting to flip-flop in our day. People actually know how to walk it out better than they know how to talk it out because all these conversations are filled with such landmines. You can't say anything without getting canceled. But in this conversation, we're gonna try to figure out how do we walk it out? And Paul says, understand that the invitation before you is to walk worthy of the calling. Two words there that you have to think about, worthy and calling. Let's start with the latter. I believe that you were made on purpose and for a purpose. I believe God has a special plan and desire for your life. I believe God is going to use the personality that he gave you, the giftings that he's given you, and all the experiences that he's walked you through to accomplish a very specific, profound, and breathtaking purpose in and through your life. I believe that. I believe that most people are going through life barely scratching the surface of their potential, never really discovering, oh my goodness, this is who you made me to be? This is what you desire to do in and through my life, that you have a calling. You should just know that. God has called you to accomplish and live out a very specific purpose. And I know that the moment you jump into the calling conversation, immediately it creates the tension around God's will and that you know, whole idea. I would say God's will is probably in the top three questions I get. How do you discern God's will. And I would say that where most people get tripped up in the calling conversation, in the will conversation, is there is what is known as the general will of God and the special will of God. So when someone says to me, hey, I just don't know what God's will is for my life. I say, well, let's open up the Bible and let's just start running down the list of things. Let's look at this three sentence passage for an example. It says that you should make every effort to maintain the unity. Are you making every effort to maintain the unity? Because that's God's will for your life. It says that you should walk humbly and with gentleness. Are you walking humbly and with gentleness? That's God's will for your life. And what you find is most people neglect and overlook the general will of God, yet then they obsess over the special will of God. Okay, I don't care about walking humbly and you know, working towards unity. I just wanna know if I should ask the bank teller out on a date. Is that God's will for my life? And essentially what we're doing is it's like we're sending our kids off to school for their first day, signing them up for trigonometry and they've never taken addition and subtraction. And there's a, 
a basic foundation that we need to have. And I would say one way to understand it is word ways and will. What I mean by that, and, and here's the statement, if you're a note taker, which you, it's a fast pass to heaven, you get to cut the whole line if you take notes. <laughs> if you are disciplined in God's word, you will discover God's ways and you will be able to discern God's will, okay? If you are disciplined in God's word, you will discover God's ways and you will be able to discern God's will. Essentially, the more you're a student of God's word, you're gonna start to discover, wait a second, I know his tendencies. I know his promises. I know his preferences. I know his character. And so even when I can't trace the hand of God, I can always trace the heart of God. In moments like this, this is the disposition of my creator. This is the heart of my God. This is the wisdom of my, you know, my Lord and Savior. And the moment you understand his ways, you start to get in situations where you're able to discern his will. In moments like this, God calls me to love. In moments like this, he calls me to live a life of integrity. In moments like this, he wants to see purity. In moments like this, he's extending an opportunity for me to live a generous life. That's his will. Does that make sense? And Paul is building this idea, live worthy of the calling. You have a calling. The part that trips us up in that is that word worthy. I mean, that almost seems like a contradiction for you and I, because how did most of us become Christians? When we discovered that we weren't worthy, that we are all fractured, broken, rebellious, sinful people who are at odds with our creator, standing on one side of a chasm with no possible chance that we could save ourselves, eternally doomed and unworthy for eternity in harmony with our heavenly father until Jesus showed up and bridged the gap. And so what happens is Jesus goes to the cross, pays the ultimate price, and now you and I are in Christ. And now we find our worth in him. The idea of living worthy is, well, it's a marketplace term. How they would make an exchange in the marketplace is they would put everything on the scales and see whether or not it balances out. Well, what happened when Jesus got on the scales? He broke the scale. So now there is no more scale. And how did he break the scale? By establishing our position as Christ, uh, our position in Christ, that we are now children of God. He did that for us. Because of what Christ did, now you and I can belong to the family of God. He established our position. So what Paul is saying, when he says live worthy of the calling, he's saying live in a way that starts to elevate your practice to your position. Live in a way that elevates your practice to your position. What Paul is not saying is he is not saying live worthy in the sense of measuring up. He's saying live worthy in the sense of fitting in. Remember, the, the whole idea of scripture in many ways is clothed with this idea of family in mind. And he's saying, no, no, no. Christ already established your position. If your faith is in Christ, you are a child of God. You have that position. Now, work towards elevating your practice, work towards fitting in with the other siblings in the faith. This is a beautiful thing. It's just recognizing, hey, I belong here. I'm a child of God. And in this space, I'm surrounded by other people who are along the same journey and they support, encourage, serve, and they are there to help me continue elevating my practice into my position. And he says, live worthy of the calling. Be humble, be gentle. And then he goes on to say, and make every effort to maintain the unity. Now we put a lot of effort towards our faith, but I wanna just put a question before you. When was the last time that you eagerly anticipated opportunities to work towards unity? When was the last time you looked at a situation and thought, hey, in this moment, I have a great opportunity 
to edify the church, to edify the body of believers, and to work towards unity. We don't think of unity as something to work for. In fact, a lot of people in our day are now avoiding the idea of unity because it has just become easier to pick the polarizing sides. Can I get an amen? I was recently a part of a, a Q&A and a pastor said, hey, what are some of the, the controversial topics that you, you know, get pressure from or get bad feedback from or what are some of the things that you find difficult to teach on? And I would just say, well, something that ironically is becoming more and more controversial that if you ever wanna get beat up as a preacher, try to speak on unity. Because if you're gonna stand in the gap and try to bridge it, know that you're gonna irritate people on both sides and they're gonna let you know about it. But that's part of the courageous call to be a follower of Christ. No, my savior stood in the gap and laid down his life as a bridge for you and I so we can have relationship with our God. And he has killed the hostility between us. And so now we too make every effort to bridge broken gaps and to bring about reconciliation in our world. And Paul so brilliantly goes on to clarify very specifically, here are some things that you put your effort towards. Make every effort to maintain the unity of spirit. One body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God. Now, every single one of those could be its own sermon, but we will give a flyover just to understand, here's what Paul is putting in front of us. For starters, he says one body. And you know, something that is comical in the American church, something that you don't see in churches around the world is in our culture, it's embarrassing, but churches compete with each other. Christians compete with each other. And it's gonna be comical. Like heaven is going to be like Thanksgiving dinner for a dysfunctional family. <laughs> like you know Thanksgiving's coming. Every year it comes the same time. You have a whole year to prepare. And then you come to Thanksgiving and there's your sister and your stepdad and everyone's around the table and you're thinking to yourself, Oh, I cannot believe they showed up. Well, duh, it's Thanksgiving. We get together every year and heaven's gonna be comical because people are gonna show up and be like, oh, he let them in? I didn't know they would be here. It's one body. And for us to ever give way to such nonsense where we start to look at other churches and other believers in some form of a competition is absolutely gross. It's one body. We should celebrate, we should pray, we should be enthusiastic and we should be overjoyed the every time we drive down the street and we see a, another church and we see a church expanding their property and we hear of a church growing and doing wonderful things in our community because their success doesn't come at our expense. We're all on the same team. We're all on the same team, come on, you can clap to that. One body. Guys, it, w let's never be that church. And, and if you show up and you've got ill feelings towards your last church, don't tell any of us about it. Turn the page, embark on something healthy, move forward. But let's be a church that understands it's one body. It's one body. He goes on to say, it's one spirit. Now, there's all these studies out that our world is increasingly intrigued by the supernatural and this emerging generation is very into spiritual matters, which there's a positive side to that. They're open to the things of God. There's a negative side to that. They're open to the nonsense of the world. And so you just have to be wise in your uh, studious approach to life. Don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out, right? Like you have to put some parameters around the big decisions that you're thinking through and aligning with. There's one spirit. All this dabbling and, no, I believe in one spirit and it's the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead and the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives and resides in every single one of us. Greater is he that is within me than he that's within the world. It's one spirit and that's all we need and that's sufficient. Two, it's one faith. Now, I, I think at a very basic level, we could say, yeah, the one faith is we all place our faith in Jesus Christ. 
Sure, that's a starting point, but it's bigger than that. Paul would many times refer to Jesus as the second Adam. Now, if you're new to Christianity, maybe this is your first time, uh, the Bible is a library of 66 books of which the first book in the Bible is Genesis. And our story begins with two naked people in a garden and a talking snake and a magical piece of fruit. <laughs> That's how we get the party started. And it's a magnificent introduction, but essentially what happens is, is Adam and Eve doubt God. Adam and Eve fall to temptation because they don't trust that God has their best in mind. And they start to think, maybe we could do better without him. And there's this blip in their faith that cracks the door and sin enters the world and the rest is history. Jesus shows up as the second Adam and he is tempted by the devil and where the first Adam, you know, tripped up in his faith, where the first Adam, you know, struggled to trust in those moments, the second Adam, Christ, was unwavering, flawless and perfect in his faith. In fact, he kept his faith all the way through the torment of the cross. Faith, perfection. And what he's saying is, is for those of us who are now in Christ, we now ride the coattails of his perfect faith. He does the heavy lifting. This is such a big idea. This is what makes me think of Jesus' parable of the mustard seed. He's like, hey, all you need is a mustard seed to say to this mountain, move, and it will be moved. Because Jesus is knowing, I've got all the faith. You get to ride the coattails of my faith if you are in Christ. It's a big idea. The, the same is true with baptism. One baptism. Yes, we all go into the waters of baptism to identify publicly with the death and the resurrection of Christ. That's a great starting point. But it's bigger than that. Jesus comes up out of the one baptism the heavens part, God the Father echoes down upon his son. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. In other words, for those of us who are in Christ, who identify with this one baptism, we should wake up every single day hearing the echo of heaven over our life. This is my child with whom I love and who I am well pleased with. That, that, that's why an insecure Christian is an oxymoron. You shouldn't be obnoxious, you shouldn't be running around arrogant, but my goodness, insecure and self-deprecating? Do you not hear the echo of heaven? You are my daughter, you are my son. I love you and I am well pleased with you. I find joy, delight, and satisfaction in you. That's the one baptism. It's like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And Paul is just building this idea. One baptism, one faith, one Lord. And it's around these things that we find unity. And he just continues to ratchet up this idea of living a mature life. And much of scripture is going to challenge us to grow up. You know, look at your neighbor and say, grow up. It always feels like an ins insulting thing. I seen this meme the other day and it, the, the meme said, my wife told me to grow up, so I kicked her out of my fort. <laughs> I love that. Verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every kind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined together and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 
And this is another miss within the westernized church. You know, Paul says, Christ gave the church apostles, prophets, shepherds, evangelists, teachers. Why? To equip the work of the saints, to help individuals be successful in their journey with Christ. And tragically, in the Western world, we turn church into a spectator sport where we just gather every single week to watch this, which is so underwhelming. Folks, I'm telling you, what makes any church great is not the preaching, it's the people. And what Paul is saying is, no, no, no. You wanna see a church reach its full potential? It's not gonna happen on the platform. It's gonna happen within the rows. Watch how God gets a hold of a life. Watch how God empowers someone to accomplish his plan for their life. Watch what God does in and through the diversity of a body of Christ where individuals come and say, God, whatever you wanna do in and through my life, let it be. And he says, we are to equip the work of the saints so everybody can play their part. And and here's the beautiful thing to that. What that says is we are perfectly assembled and we have everything we need to accomplish what God has in mind for us in this season. We have all the wisdom that we need right now to accomplish what God has in mind for us in this season. We have all the talent right now within our church to accomplish what God has in mind for us. In fact, we even have all the money that we need to fund the mission and vision of our church right now in this season. Only challenge is it's in your bank account, not the church's at the moment, but that could happen, (laughs) right? Come on, church, I'll be a fun place, laugh. (laughs) Only 2% of Christians actually tithe, so it's not even that big of a deal. So what's funny, though, is he's saying, when we all understand that we have this opportunity to live out our full potential, it now comes with this anticipation and eagerness of like, wait a second, everyone else is on the same page? We're all taking steps together. Wait a second, we can't reach our full potential until we all reach our full potential? Well, the moment you have a community of people who just bail on the whole spectator sport idea and understand all that does is produce consumers, God's after contributors. And so how do we contribute to what God is doing in and through the world? And he's just saying, let's let's mature And let's grow into this because what's gonna happen is there are gonna come times where life is gonna throw you a curveball. There are gonna come times where society and culture and whatever peer pressure you're facing is gonna run against the grain of your faith. And if you are not built up, rooted, and equipped for this journey, you're gonna be tossed to and fro like an infant. And he then ends with this. He says, therefore... Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I I think there's so much there, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. He says, you know, put off falsehood. That, that one of the easiest and most important things for us as believers as we gather as a church is to put off falsehood. That the church should be the most honest place on the planet. That if there's any place that we take the mask off, if there's any place that we put the facade down, it's church. Because the one who knows you the best loves you the most and there's other people who believe the same thing so you can come as you are because God accepts you and is committed to you. We we gotta put off falsehood. Otherwise we show up and we play charades and Well, God can't fix what you fake. He came for the real you. He came for the the real me. And we have to, I I would love it if one of the hallmarks of our church was, hey, they're just known for their genuine authenticity. That's a place with real people facing real issues, yet discovering and relying on a real God. It's a beautiful thing. 
says, put off falsehood. Don't do all these other things. Live a life of purity. You know, understand the peace and the joy that that will produce in and through your life. And he makes that statement. He says, and when you're angry, do not sin in your anger. I, for the person who throws temper tantrums, it almost feels like permission, right? To be angry. <laughs> and what he's saying is, it's not wrong to be angry. There are things that when you look at the world, you should have a righteous indignation. That's wrong. That is against God's will. He's saying, but when you're angry, do not sin in your anger. He, he's saying, essentially, most of people's sinful behavior is produced out of the mismanagement of their emotions. I, I'm just not, when we mismanage our emotions, that's when we tend to fall into unproductive behaviors. And that's when we give the devil a foothold. That's what Paul says. No, don't mismanage your emotions also that the devil can get a foothold. Well, what's a foothold? It's a place you put your foot in to gain proper footing and traction when you're climbing something. And essentially, when you and I mismanage our emotions and we don't develop a godly composure, well, we give the devil a foothold to gain traction in our life. And here's the thing. His goal is not footholds. His goal is strangleholds. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. And as he gains traction, he's looking to move that foothold into a stranglehold. And he says, oh yeah, well this happens through the mismanagement of our emotions and the poor communication that we operate with. And he says that statement, he says, so let only what is helpful come out of your mouth. Man, would that change the world. Only what is helpful. And again, come on, you've seen my errors. None of us are batting a thousand. But as we elevate our practice into our position, this is something God's like, you can get better at this. You can take on the image and the character and the likeliness of Christ. You can grow in maturity and stature. My dad is a preacher and when I was a kid, he uh, would travel around and speak at these events and like most preachers, we all have our favorite stories and analogies and he had this one about Alexander the Great, which he's gonna watch this back and tell me I didn't do it justice because he, he was so good at it. Um, but here's the cliff notes. There was this real time in history where Alexander the Great uh, was holding court and they bring in this soldier who was being tried for being a coward. Essentially what happened is, is this soldier ran when the enemy showed up. And so they brought him on the trial saying, hey, he ran in the face of enemies he's a coward, what should we do with him? So Alexander the Great is asking the guy some questions. And at one point he says, son, what is your name? And Alexander the, uh, the kid says, Alexander. And Alexander the Great says, no, what is your name? And the soldier responded, Alexander. And then there's this epic statement he makes in response. Alexander the Great says, okay, will either change your name or change your conduct. I love that. Either change your name or change your conduct. One of the biggest blessings in disguise over the last few years is it has completely eradicated our culture of cultural Christianity. And at the end of the day, if you're not a Christian, that's fine. But if you're gonna call yourself a Christian, and you're gonna go out there with the seal and the stamp of approval upon your life representing God. Well, either change your conduct or change your name. Let's live in a way that says, no, I, I take this faith thing seriously. This is not an accessory to my life. I believe that this Jesus truly did redefine humanity and what it means to live life to the full. And every single day, I'm trying to do that. Every single day, I'm trying to become more and more like him. Not because I have to, but my goodness, because I get to. And what would happen if our church was just known for just putting into the community people who look, act, and talk like Jesus? I think it would be a game changer. I think it would be a game changer.